I cannot believe that it's already been over two years since I started the Metal Gear Marathon. If you've watched my videos based on the MSX Metal Gears through to Metal Gear Solid 4 back in 2014, then you should know that I'm a very, very big fan of the series and enjoy diving myself into the deep, heavy, and just plain bonkers stories and sneaking around guards however I please. And now we're going to talk about a couple more, starting with 2010's Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker for the PlayStation Portable. That I do not own myself and will instead be looking at the HD version that came out a year later in the US and a few months afterwards in Europe for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. This isn't really the first time we've seen a Metal Gear game on a handheld. Before this, we had three other games on the PSP where the series creator and director Hideo Kojima was only the producer instead of the head honcho, one of which being a traditional Metal Gear game called Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops, and also Metal Gear Acid 1 and 2, which were turn-based card games. But if you want to go back further, then technically you couldn't play a Metal Gear game on the go until Metal Gear Ghost Babel, or just simply Metal Gear Solid in the US, arrived in stores for the Game Boy Color. From what I've gathered, not a lot of people really appreciate Portable Ops for what it was, which I can't argue with since I've never played it fully. I barely hear anybody talk about the Acid games, but plenty of players really seem to enjoy Ghost Babel. I was actually going to review Portable Ops and the Acid games before Peace Walker, ever since I found out that the emulator I use to record older games called OpenMU allows for PSP games now. However, while they all played perfectly fine, I came across some audio issues during the gameplay for Portable Ops and Acid 2. I couldn't even get Acid 1 to work at all. The audio was nice and clear while the cutscenes ran, but I didn't want to provide tatty gameplay audio for you guys. Apologies to those of you who would have liked to see me review these games sooner, but I like to keep my reviews of the highest quality possible, which is why I took a film and television course after all, and it's partly the reason I take so long to make reviews in the first place. And I just simply didn't think it was going to be possible with audio problems like this. <coughs> Nevertheless, Hideo Kojima is back to show people how to make a proper Metal Gear handheld game with Peace Walker. And unless you count Snake Eater 3D, this is so far the last time we'll be able to play a Metal Gear game on your train journeys or your next trip to the bathroom. Thank you Konami for pulling Kojima out of his own series. You want to know how dedicated Kojima was on this game? Before Phantom Pain was released, Peace Walker was originally going to be called Metal Gear Solid 5 Peace Walker. Despite that name, we're not actually continuing the plot from Metal Gear Solid 4, but rather carrying on with Naked Snake's story now that he has the title of Big Boss. This time we're in 1974, 10 years after the Snake Eater mission. Big Boss and his faithful assistant, Kazuhira Miller from Metal Gear 2 and to a lesser extent MGS1, have put together a small mercenary group called Militaire Sans Frontières, an army without borders. Soon after Snake does a bit of training from this guy that loves nothing more than screaming button combinations at the top of his lungs, he and Kaz are approached by Professor Ramon Galvez from the University of Peace and one of his students named Paz Ortega Andrade. They say that they want to hire MSF to take back parts of Costa Rica that are secretly controlled by an army, and in exchange, Galvez will provide a military base for MSF to grow. But while Snake ultimately refuses at first after he finds out that Galvez is actually a KGB spy, he quickly changes his mind after he plays a recording pause made of his former mentor, The Boss. Eager for answers, Snake agrees to help as he claims he wants to do it for Paz and create peace, but I no doubt think he's just doing it for himself, and he arrives in Costa Rica and begins to suspect that the army Galvez mentioned might be holding nuclear weapons, and lo and behold, he finds a shipment not too long after. What incredible luck. He managed to find these nukes with the help of a Costa Rican revolutionary called Amanda and her younger monster-loving brother Chico after saving them from flying mechs that belonged to the secret army. Chico's pretty much responsible for the attack, however, because he confessed their location to the enemy while being interrogated. Searching for the shipment of nukes eventually leads us to our primary antagonist, Hot Coldman. I really wish I was making that up. But anyway, in the same room that we're introduced to Mr. Coldman, we're also greeted to Otacon's father, called Huey Emmerich. Okay, unintentionally meeting up with Meryl and Guns of the Patriots was a big enough coincidence as it is. But good god, what are the odds that both Big Boss and Solid Snake have met members of the Emmerich family? Lady Luck is really on their sides in these games. Oh, I'm sorry, Fortune. Huey is the designer for a live nuclear tank codenamed Peace Walker that Coleman plans to fire, in which Huey decides to help stop him and instruct Snake to look for Dr. Strangelove, who created the AI for Peace Walker that has a voice and personality very similar to the boss. In fact, it's identical. It turns out Strangelove and the boss had a very special relationship, though it's not really told how. The game more or less hints that they either had a powerful friendship or probably went as far as having feelings for one another, but even in the torture scene later in the game, which we should probably take shots at by this point in the series, Strangelove never explains how she knows the boss. And is it me, or does Strangelove sound an awful lot like CL from Black Butler? This is an order. Save me now! Answer me! Did 
she or did she not die for her country? Anyway, about the torture scene. She wants to know from Snake whether or not the boss actually defected to the Soviet Union during the events of Snake Eater, or if she died on a mission that was kept secret. Snake sticks to his story about the boss turning herself to the other side, but Strangelove doesn't believe him and locks him up in a cell that Snake easily breaks out of and chases after Peace Walker. Which leads us to a base where we meet up with Hot Coldman again and he justifies the creation of his walking death machine. He believes that nuclear deterrence is flawed by having to rely on humans retaliating to a nuclear strike and start a war, where in most cases they wouldn't exactly feel comfortable wiping out a large portion of their own race. Artificial intelligence, on the other hand, is guaranteed to retaliate, and Coleman wants to prove this by firing a nuclear warhead. Why he needs to test his theory out, I don't know. I would think striking back is essentially putting oil in the fire. And to put salt on an open wound, he's also responsible for arranging the boss's death in Snake Eater and pulling the strings on Snake. But that gets glanced over pretty quickly. We have enough reason to take Coleman out anyway because of threatening to launch a nuke. I should probably mention that there is another woman involved in the story called Cecile, but aside from giving you an ID card to Strangelove's laboratory, she does absolutely nothing else to contribute. All I can remember about her is that she's French, she's pretty, she makes bird noises, and loves to flirt with Snake and tease him about the possibility of her engaging in lesbian activities. I think she must have been talking about an old lover. Lover? You mean another woman? <laughs> My! Aren't we curious about the women and other women? You want to hear the terrible things she tried to do to me? Zip up your pants, she never tells you. That'll do with a story for now until we reach spoiler territory, so let's cover the gameplay while we get there. Peace Walker is still sorely focused on stealth, just like the previous games, but aside from that, it's a very unusual Metal Gear entry. Since this was originally made for the PSP and that people might not have time to invest in sneaking across large open plains, Peace Walker cuts the gameplay into chunks, and by that I mean there's now a mission structure which includes missions to carry on with the story, or a variety of side operations to sink your teeth into, including protecting bases, rescuing a prisoner, playing a little arcade game, putting the souls of enemies back in their bodies, or a date with Paz or even Kaz. The Japanese are strange. And I can't say I'm really comfortable being given the option to beat the crap out of Paz or even grope her. Completing certain operations will unlock more weapons and items as well as earn you extra money. Yep, the currency system from Guns of the Patriots is back and you need every bit of money to buy as much equipment as possible. But no doubt the key inclusion to Peace Walker is building up Mother Base, the main aspect of Militaire Sans Frontier. I'll try and explain this as clearly as I can because the game doesn't do a very good job at it. You see, you can't exactly buy equipment until certain departments in Mother Base, like combat, research and development, or catering, reach a certain level by recruiting more staff to Mother Base. And even then, each staff member is best skilled for certain departments, and even then, some staff members are more skilled than others. And you can only recruit a specific amount of staff members in each department before you run out of room and you have to fire a whole load of your employees to have available positions. The bigger the amount of skilled staff you recruit, the higher you raise that department's level to make certain equipment available to purchase and take time to develop. You can hire people by either waiting until you get far enough in the story to earn the recruit menu option to show volunteers your fighting techniques, or probably the way you'll do it the most often, using Fulton recovery balloons on prisoners and knock down enemies to whisk them away to Mother Base, where they become available after you finish the current mission. The concept of hiring staff technically started with portable ops, but in that game you had to drag enemies to your vehicle during your mission, which many people quickly found to be time-consuming and tedious. So the Fulton recovery system is a nice improvement from how portable ops handled it. It's ridiculous, yes, and I don't know how the balloons float to Mother Base while indoors, but it makes for good results and it's a good way to encourage players to use non-lethal methods for taking out guards. Staff members in the combat facility can eventually be taken to Outer Ops where you can arrange teams and send them to battles to earn more money and blueprints for new weapons while you go off to do another mission or two. They each get harder as they go on, so be sure to recruit some intensely skilled soldiers along your travels. I do kind of wish there was slightly more visual flair to the battles though. As it is, the turn-based RPG style is nice to watch, but only one time. Every other moment, I'm just skipping through it all. Missions can each range from around a few minutes to ten minutes or more. And you can sort your loadout before beginning each mission, including weapons, tools, and camouflage returning from Snake Eater and Guns of the Patriots, which sadly isn't as useful as the last two games. They sort of work, I guess, but you can't change camouflage on the fly anymore, and the guards' visions aren't up to snuff anyway, so it doesn't particularly matter in the long run. The only ones that really matter are the sneaking suit, which silences your footsteps at the cost of less ammo, and the battle dress for combat situations. You don't even have to play a snake either, unless they're story missions. If you wanted to, you can decide to play as one of your staff members in the combat unit instead. 
including Hideo Kojima himself, who you can also recruit to Mother Base. He's under a balaclava though, which is a shame, but it's cool to hire him. You can also take the time to listen to audio recordings that give some background to the characters and some comedic conversations, a few of which bring back Eva, giving more fluff to the boss's astronaut life. But to me at least, the fluff's not really worth including to such meaningless backstory. They're not all interesting, but there should be at least a couple that'll make you raise an eyebrow. Cecile Cosima Caminades. Cosima Caminades. Hey, that's close to... Close to what? Your name. It sounds almost like the sentence, Kojima Caminandes, in Japanese. And what does it mean, s'il vous plaît? Well, Kami is the word for God in Japanese. Nandesu. Well, it's hard to explain, but placed after God, it would turn the sentence into, is God. Okay, so? Kojima is God. Cecile's name is a message. I don't believe it. Kojima is God. Kojima is God. Jesus Christ, can a man be any more egotistical than that? At the end of each scenario, you'll receive a rank based on how well you perform, such as not getting caught and not killing anybody, which increases your heroism to attract volunteers with a higher status the more you receive in total. Getting an S rank is mandatory in some missions if you want to get some of the best equipment in the game. These features help for when playing on the go, but it would have been nice to maybe include an approximate of how long the mission is, so that you have a rough idea when to stop playing before arriving at your destination. The default controls are almost the same as it was in Metal Gear Solid 4, but you can't crawl or shimmy on walls anymore, which I'm not really sure why. The PSP has enough buttons to make it happen, so what's the deal? Well, you can kind of do those things, but you can't move anymore, so I don't find myself lying down or sticking to walls nearly as much as I did in the other games. The PSP original also uses the face buttons to control the camera, which even though I've never played that version, I can only assume that it felt really awkward. The HD version on the PS3 and Xbox 360 fixes this by using the right analog stick, but there's a slight hindrance to that too. Peace Walker's level design was made with the strange camera controls in mind, so now that it's been altered for the better, you may find yourself playing one of the easiest Metal Gear games you'll ever experience. The environments are rather compact and linear, as well as not having too many guards around, which means it isn't very hard to just tranquilize and fold in them, leaving no trace behind for their buddies to be suspicious. And the game only gets easier once you upgrade your weapons. Ah, the Soliton Radar, how I've missed you so. Kind of a shame it runs on batteries now unless you upgrade it to its fifth rank, but I'm so glad to have this back. Sure, you do have the option of downgrading your weapon if you've purchased it and want more of a challenge, but as I've explained in my review of Mega Man 2 and Batman Arkham Asylum, if I'm given the option to use overpowered weapons and tools, I ain't gonna ignore them. Now when I say the game gets easier, I'm mainly talking about the sneaking and firefight missions. The boss fights, on the other hand, are just plain poppycock from beginning to end. These are some of the biggest bullet sponges for bosses I've ever freaking seen. They start off simple enough, but later encounters will take forever to chip down even one bar of their health. And doing the non-lethal method is just as much of a pain in the ass. In fact, it's pretty much required when you're on your own. For the battles against the armored vehicles, tanks, and helicopters, you have to take out all of the guards around it. And once you get rid of them all, the driver or the pilot will peek out where you can either kill him or tranquilize him and take the vehicle back to Mother Base. However, it becomes an even bigger annoyance if you choose to terminate the guards, because then you have to take a lot of the vehicle's health down before the driver or the pilot will even come out. And for the love of God, do not get caught while disposing the guards. If even one of them spots you or the vehicle looks in your direction, you may as well restart the mission, because they become absolutely relentless to rid of you afterwards. It is possible for them to lose sight of you, but you'd have to be damn sure you're in a good hiding place and you get rid of any guards that come in your way. I'd recommend looking up some YouTube videos or wikis for strategies and how to unlock better weapons because there's no way in hell you can take these vehicles on by yourself with so little gear. The bosses you come across in the story are a little better, but again, they have way too much health and their attack patterns can be pretty cheap. Especially Peace Walker itself near the end of the story where it can take over half an hour to beat. And no, I don't consider this to be a spoiler because by this point in the series we should come to expect it. They really pack a punch too, especially the tougher variations you find in the side missions where you can only afford to get hit a few times before you're dead. Pack as many recovery items as you can and upgrade those rocket launchers, folks. They will save your life. Be careful of item weight as well because they'll slow you down if you're carrying a heavy load. And then there are the optional crossover clashes with Capcom's Monster Hunter series. I thought I saw it all when the Metal Gear series had Cyborg Ninjas and Ocelot turning into Liquid but I think Big Boss taking on giant reptilian beasts might just take the cake for the silliest moments in any Metal Gear game. 
You can even battle against Metal Gear Rex before it became a robot. And by Jesus is it hard when it's in Mother Base. It's not completely obvious how you find these though. You have to pick a specific side mission and go to a specific point in the map where you're greeted by a talking cat. I don't know, I've only ever played the first two hours of Monster Hunter Try to this day. But anyway, he takes you on an island where you find the monsters and little blue velociraptor looking things. Breaking off pieces of the monsters is pretty satisfying, but they take forever to put to sleep. At least a hundred tranquilizers. But you have a better chance of unlocking the extra stuff they drop by putting them to sleep anyway. In fact, that's the only way to unlock their camos. I can make Big Boss roar with all his might to stun foes. There are a lot of wacky weapons you can obtain in this game. Like a musket that has a chance of creating a tornado to blow enemies away to Mother Base. Maybe you and a friend would like to go all Ghostbusters and cross the streams to make a huge explosion. Want to make the vehicle battles insanely easy? Then unlock yourself the electromagnetic net to carry the vehicle away. Or how about the ultimate human slingshot that requires four people and fling your best friend on the bosses to do major damage? Hell, it even takes out some of the vehicles in one single hit. It doesn't make sense how that works, but it is hilarious. But why stop there? Why not swan dive into the haystack box ripped right out of the Assassin's Creed games and drag the enemies inside to beat them up? That's the second time Assassin's Creed's been an Easter egg in these games. The first one being the Altair costume in Metal Gear Solid 4. Unfortunately, aside from the Assassin box, you're gonna have to do a fair bit of staff farming to get the best gear, but once you have them, they're incredibly useful. But back on the subject of the boss battles, I think they were all built with the game's online co-op system in mind, because these are all very brutal when doing it on single player. The mech bosses during the main ops aren't so bad, but as I've said before, the upgraded ones on the side missions are next to impossible to do on your own. At least not without going out of your way to get some of the best gear. Even with supply markers that drop in more ammo and health restoring items. Having a buddy to tag along with makes combat situations a ton easier, especially if they have better equipment than you. But you'd have to have some seriously good cooperation with them, doubly so for the sneaking missions. In-game prompts and messages can only do so much. I'd recommend playing with a friend though, it's a lot of fun and highly satisfying when neither of you get caught and you get that sweet S rank in the end. Special thanks to my brother Jude, my best friend Damien, and my good buddy Jack for sticking with me for some intense multiplayer. You guys made the boss fights much more tolerable. I don't like how the number of soldiers and hit points during the bosses increase the more players there are on the battlefield though. I think that's needlessly cruel to already difficult battles. So I suppose technically co-op does make things a bit harder, but it's certainly more enjoyable. I only wish you could somehow play locally to save all the hassle of connecting to the internet and having to keep sending invites. Don't think you can call forth a ton of people, however. You can only have up to two people playing sneaking missions, including yourself, and up to four people during the boss fights. I personally think the co-op feature is only best during the side ops, because when playing the story missions together, there's a chance that you may come across a person online that hasn't watched the cutscenes and you can't advance to the mission until everybody's watched the cutscene or decided to skip it. That kind of sucks. I mean, it's great for people just getting into the game, but it's not so great for those who already know what's going on. After going through some of the story, you'll actually be able to build your very own Metal Gear called Zeke, where you can get pieces for it by S-ranking the mech battles and picking apart their AI boards after each fight to make it more powerful, assuming you haven't damaged the parts you need during the confrontation. I'll say this right now, if you want to see the true ending to the game, you're going to need to S-rank the Chrysalis battle to obtain the Railgun and put it on Zeke. Replay the mission if you have to, because there isn't any other way to fully build Zeke. Once your Metal Gear is ready to activate though, you can send it to do some outer ops and completely destroy opponents. It's good for clearing out brutally difficult operations. You're almost unstoppable by this point if you've already commandeered some vehicles. As you may have noticed by now, the cutscenes are extraordinarily different compared to the previous games. Real-time cutscenes are very rare to come by, so to make up for the PSP's limited space but still have that Metal Gear feel to it, Konami had to compromise with these graphic novel-style cinematics, which do surprisingly fit. Again, this isn't anything new to the series, Portable Ops used it first, but regardless, once you get used to the change, it's nice and still manages to have its dramatic, touching, and funny moments. I only wish that the QuickTime events weren't there, that I could have done without. Musically speaking, eh, it's okay, a little bland, but there are a couple of good tracks. Heaven's Divide by Donna Burke is certainly worthy of being one of my favorite Metal Gear songs ever, right next to Snake Eater, The Best Is Yet To Come, and Sins of the Father. The Peace Walker battle music's pretty epic too, but probably because I had to hear it non-stop while playing Phantom Pain. I also quite like the remix of the Game Over music from MGS1 and 2. Are you alright? Snake? Snake! Aside from those, I'm not really keen on the soundtrack as a whole. I know that music isn't the point of Metal Gear, but music can make all the difference if done correctly. I know I'm milking this cow dry, but take a look at the Castlevania games again. Awesome music that heightens the mood of the given situation and gives you an amount of adrenaline to kick serious ass. 
Now analyze something like, say, Xenoblade Chronicles X, and tell me if the chosen music in battles doesn't just ruin the mood a little. At least the music's appropriate throughout the story, and speaking of which, let's get back to that, shall we? Skip to this point in the video if you wish to avoid spoilers and want to catch yourself up before heading into Phantom Pain. After Coleman monologues about his nuclear deterrence theory, Soviet soldiers arrive who are led by Professor Calvez, real name Vladimir Zadornov, and he intends to take Peace Walker for the Russians, but the MSF come in before he can and take on the Russian soldiers, giving Snake enough time to go after Peace Walker and destroy it. And I mean destroy it. The third part of the battle involves firing everything you've got at the weakened Peace Walker while the AI goes haywire. Almost like you're beating the boss to death while she loses her mind. After an infuriatingly long boss battle, Zadordov is taken into custody while Coldman, before kicking the bucket, activates Peace Walker's communications link to convince the United States that they're about to be hit by a nuclear strike. Snake contacts the Secretary of Defense and persuades him to stand down, but some of his colleagues get a bit too jumpy and plan their own retaliatory nuclear strike. However, Peace Walker suddenly becomes sentient and drowns itself in a lake, cutting the connection and cancelling the attack. It's implied that the boss's soul was able to take control of Peace Walker and allow it to kill itself, but that's pretty far-fetched if you ask me, even for a Metal Gear story. I know that the series is famous for its supernatural and fantasy elements, but it also has a sense of realism added to it in some form or fashion. And a ghost controlling a robot is a little more than I can swallow. Still, at least it's not as stupid as Ocelot sporadically turning into liquid. Anyway, Snake finally comes to terms with the boss's death after all these years and now prefers to be called Big Boss. Where the game supposedly ends, but not until after the credits do you realize that there's still another chapter full of story to tell. At this point, you're pretty much free to do whatever you want, like if you have any side ops left to do or equipment to unlock. But the extra story missions you get involves a doorknob repeatedly escaping Mother Base and Snake has to go back to locations he's previously been through and locate where the doorknob is hiding. This happens about six times, and while it does get more and more tedious as it goes on, it admittedly becomes quite humorous to see Snake get increasingly annoyed. Still though, this part could have definitely been cut. It serves nothing more other than forcing players to play some of the side ups in hopes of activating the next story mission. After Zadornov escapes for a seventh time, Big Boss finally suspects that someone must be helping him get out. But this time he and Kaz are unable to pick up his trail, so only by sheer luck or by complete accident would you ever think to go to the very first side mission, which is a target practicing mission that you've probably already done by this point, and you would simply find him on the top of the stairs with faint laughter. Keep in mind as well that there are exactly 128 side missions to do, so exactly what are the chances that you're going to choose this one specific mission in order to finish the story? I'm a huge fan of the Metal Gear games, but even I can admit that this is a dumb way to get people to play more of the game in the off chance that they may come across the doorknob. So skipping past that, Zadornov gets killed off after trying to rocket punch Snake to death, and Kaz reports to Big Boss that Metal Gear Zeke has been stolen. Snake quickly rushes outside to see that it's Paz who's taking control of Zeke, in her underwear. Well, that's not the worst we'll see yet. With Zadornov's constant escaping to be nothing more than a distraction. Paz, aka Pacifica Ocean, is also in fact an agent of something called Cypher, and she issues an ultimatum for Snake to surrender himself and become a deterrent to Cypher, or else she'll fire a nuclear warhead on America, basically giving MSF a bad name of being trigger happy with nukes and carrying a lot of them, leading the entire world to go after MSF. And this all builds to the final battle against Paz and Metal Gear Zeke, which also plays like a standard Metal Gear fight, but it's a lot easier and much shorter than the Peace Walker battle. Thank God for that. There's also something rather pleasurable about calling in an airstrike to annihilate Zeke. I don't really know why. But there is a slight problem with the final boss music. The whole battle is accompanied by a J-pop song of all things, sung by the Japanese voice actress for Paz, which is surprisingly catchy and brings a lot of energy to the fight, but I think this is probably the least fitting final boss theme I've ever heard in a video game. So Snake prevents Zeke from launching a nuke and Paz is ejected into the ocean. 
Big Boss and Kaz manage to figure out that Cypher is actually a code that translates to Zero, as in Major Zero from the Snake Eater mission and the cause of everything that's happened in the series. Big Boss, once again being the king of military speeches, orders Kaz to assemble the men that he now says live in their own heaven and hell, their outer heaven, and to prepare for the fight of their life that we won't see until four to five years later. Oh, and Huey and Strangelove now fancy each other after a one minute conversation. That was very quick. And that was Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. For a handheld Metal Gear game, this is a pretty good attempt, especially on the gameplay side of things, except for the bosses. Story-wise, on the other hand, this is certainly one of the weakest plots Kojima's made, in my opinion. The mission structure and development of Mother Base are both nice inclusions to the usual Metal Gear shtick, but the story is honestly not what I would call amazing. Not terrible, but I feel like I've seen all this before in previous entries. It's not as contrived, overly complicated, confusing, or for lack of a better word, lengthy as Metal Gear Solid 4 story. But there's definitely something missing with the writing, and I can't quite put my finger on it. It's not just the storytelling that's deteriorated in quality. The gameplay environments are rather bland and very tight in space, the boss battles suck really hard, and some missions are nearly impossible to do on single player. I would only recommend Peace Walker to die-hard fans of the series, or if you want to watch the story unfold and experience Naked Snake's journey before heading into Metal Gear Solid V. The amount of customization and freedom is all very nice, but sneaking around simply doesn't feel as satisfying to me. It takes ages to choke somebody for one thing, and of course Snake also doesn't feel as mobile. I understand that a Metal Gear game on the PSP could be asking a lot, and I'm not saying that Peace Walker is bad, but Metal Gear games in my opinion are more suited for consoles. Not only because of the long cutscenes, but also the gameplay, thanks to the larger space, making room for more detailed structures and a more impressive scale to the game. Regardless, getting an S rank at the end of each mission does feel very rewarding, and the crazy amount of unlockables gives you a strange sort of one more mission type of vibe. Oddly, I also found the game to be much better after finishing the Peace Walker part of the story, Zadornov hunting notwithstanding. There's a lot of freedom and choice by that point, and having no story based on lockables to worry about makes everything more comfortable. You really do feel like Big Boss, moving on from tactical espionage action to tactical espionage operations. Before this review, I can never finish every single side up and get some of the best equipment in the game. The extra boss battles frustrated me so much that I simply gave up and could not hope to fully complete everything. Starting over for this video gave me a second chance. I made it my mission to try and vanquish all the side ups without folding the towel. It took me many attempts, I had to look up all sorts of tricks and secrets on the internet, I got the infinite ammo bandana, stealth camouflage, and all sorts of powerful weapons, and it took me a very, very long time, but I finally did it. I made those bosses my bitch, and I completed every single side op in Peace Walker and unlocked the secret tape of Kaz talking with Zero. Yeah, I know the voice is supposed to be unknown, but come on, it's so obviously Kaz. I felt immensely accomplished. I'm not even gonna bother trying to complete this game 100% for now, because I've already played way more than I should have, and I know getting all the insignias, S-ranking all the missions, and especially gathering all the AI boards for Zeke is gonna be too much of a hassle to do. I just wanna move on to other games. For a PSP game, Peace Walker could have been a hell of a lot worse. I recall countless franchises coming to the PSP and getting subpar or mediocre games to follow, so I am glad Peace Walker's the way it is if they had to put a Metal Gear game on the PSP. Graphically, it doesn't look amazing, being on a handheld and all that, but there's some nice detail to the larger character models. But why does Snake's face have to look so blah at times? Sometimes his model is fine, but other times there's very heavy pixelation and Snake never changes his expression aside from the final cutscenes. It just looks really weird. He's apparently super strong, too. Look at this, how does he manage to push that back? Is Big Boss a superhero or something? But yes, otherwise another great game from Kojima and Konami, though in my opinion probably my least favorite of the canon solid games. In spite of that, it's a great starting point if you're just getting into the series. I still think Snake Eater and Metal Gear Solid 1's the far better option. You may miss some finer details of the story without playing them. But with the helpful tutorial and new characters, Peace Walker's a game that can please both Metal Gear fans and newcomers, and I strongly suggest playing this with friends. It's good enough as a single-player adventure, but it's a lot more fun with others, and the game was built to be that way. Well, this has once again been a longer video than I thought it would be, but thinking about it, I doubt any of my Metal Gear videos are going to be as long as the Guns of the Patriots review. Who knows, though, because it's time for the big ones, ladies and gentlemen. The ones fans have been waiting eagerly to play, including yours truly, and the ones you guys have been wanting me to talk about for quite a while now. 
It's been a long time coming, but in the next video we will be looking at Metal Gear Solid 5, Ground Zeroes, and the Phantom Pain. Have yourselves a good day. Snake, how much do you know about the U.S. Homeland Air Defense Network? Uh, I don't know much about what goes on up in the sky. What I do know is that NORAD tracks Santa Claus on its radar. <laughs> nice one. I didn't know you were a comedian, too. Huh? No, I'm serious. <laughs> it's true. NORAD tracks his... <laughs> Listen to me. Every December, they set up a hotline and... <laughs> Okay, okay, I get it. He's real, I tell ya. He needs to bring me presents and... <laughs>